Hey, good morning and uh, welcome to class. Sorry, I'm having a little problem with uh, my camera. It worked perfectly fine in the first two hours. I took class for the first years. It was working, but uh, it's not coming on. So okay, we'll just uh, hope that will come on. Uh, we'll begin, but uh, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone you need us in prayer? Say, will you be able to lead us in prayer? Yes, Pastor. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for another class. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you for all you have been teaching us, Lord through your daughter thank you for preparing us lord for what is ahead of us and thank you lord for making your word lord available for us lord to learn from the doctrine of what it means to be a believer in christ jesus and all that is expected of us lord to live by Lord, we come in this class unto you. We pray by the Spirit of God, give each and every one of us understanding of what will be taught today. And Lord, for your daughter, we pray, Lord, that in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, you will give her the wisdom, Lord, to impact upon us, Lord, the knowledge required for us, Lord, to understand your word, and, Lord, to be teachers of your word to others. Oh, Lord, you will bring an encounter with us, Lord, to teach your word. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful class. We bless your holy name. We will not remain the same way we came into this class. All to your praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure why my camera is not coming up, but uh, you're not able to see me. It's coming here in this Logitech, but uh, okay. Praise God. <laughs> I mean, all of these little things just uh, really trouble our minds. Okay, we were looking at uh, chapter 10 in, um, in the previous class on, on Wednesday, and today we'll be looking at uh, uh, chapter 11. So in uh, chapter 10, we saw, you know, basically how... Um, you know, we saw that uh, uh, just a minute. Yeah, the importance of uh, the word. Uh, we need to keep the word in our heart, in our mouth. And also we see the importance of uh, preaching uh, the word and, um, you know, and Paul says that those who believe, you know, will uh, receive righteousness by faith and not by keeping the law. And uh, he says that, uh, you know, the, the, the Jews are trying to receive their own righteousness. They're trying to work out their own righteousness by keeping the law and it's not going to work. But he says those who receive righteousness are those who receive um, righteousness uh, by faith. And uh, he talks about, you know, uh, his own zeal and his passion for his own people uh, to know uh, God, to be saved. And uh, he's, um, you know, answering this question, you know, uh, has God forgotten 
uh, about uh, the Jews. You know, uh, you know, they were given all the promises. They were given the covenants. They had the law. They from them were uh, uh, the priests that who came up. Um, so has God forgotten all of this? And uh, Paul says, no, he's not forgotten. But uh, the very fact that you know the uh, the gospel is being preached to the Gentiles and salvation is being made available uh, to the Gentiles, uh, Paul says, is uh, because, you know, uh, he wants to stir up uh, the Jews, you know, he's provoking them. He's actually waking them up from their sleep, from their slumber, uh, you know, and uh, telling them, uh, you know, it's because they are trying to work out their own righteousness by keeping the law and not by faith uh, that, you know, they will be justified, that they will be uh, in right standing uh, with God. And so he talks about uh, how, you know, a person can be made righteous by faith and not by keeping the law. And then he goes on uh, to talk about the word uh, by quoting uh, Deuteronomy and uh, there it talks Moses is talking about the law but uh, you know uh, Paul here is talking about the word he says the word is near you it's in your mouth and in your heart and what do we do with that word you know he just gives us the dynamics of what we need to do he says we need to believe in our heart and we need to confess and it's not something that we believe in our heart uh, and confess it's not a one-time thing um, but he says the other dynamic of this whole thing of keeping uh, uh, God's word in near, our, near us it's in our heart and it's in our mouth it's something that should become a lifestyle for it for us it's something that we live by it's something that becomes a way of um, uh, life for us and he says it's not only that we keep it uh, with us is not something that we believe and that we keep confessing it uh, because when we believe and we keep confessing it we receive more of the blessings of what jesus has done on the cross for us he says it's important for us to also share this with others okay and uh, he says you know whoever will uh, hear uh, these words of the gospel uh, will believe and whoever uh, believes there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved. So he's basically talking of uh, motivating us uh, to share this message of Christ, to share this word of faith, uh, which is what Christ has done, what he has accomplished for us on the cross. Okay, and then he says, How can anyone hear if they uh, you know, if nobody tells them, and how can they believe if uh, no one preaches to them, and how can somebody preach if nobody uh, is sent? So the importance um, here, he's talking about the uh, verses 14 and 15 in uh, chapter 10, was a classic text to encourage people for uh, missions, and um, he says it's important that people hear the gospel. They can only hear when they. Uh, uh, they can only believe when they hear and they can only hear when somebody goes and uh, preaches to them. So he says, you know, hasn't uh, the Jews heard about the gospel message? He says, no, they have heard. Uh, did Israel not know about this gospel message? He says, no, they have uh, heard, but because they have hardened their hearts, you know, God has let them to go in their own way. Uh, to make their own choices, to lift the consequences of their own choices. But because they rejected the truth, you know, the truth has, uh, the gospel is now being taken to the Gentiles. And even the gospel being taken to the Gentiles is for a reason that God would provoke the Jews to jealousy. So that uh, through the Gentiles coming to know uh, Christ, through them receiving salvation, it will somehow awaken the Jews to know about Jesus Christ, okay? So that is what uh, he uh, shares and or he writes to the church at Rome in chapter 10. Now we'll move on to chapter 11 where he's continuing talking on these same lines. He's talking about God's plan for uh, Israel. So in chapter 11, Paul is revealing to us God's plan for Israel. He's showing us of God's plan of um, uh, sharing the gospel to the Gentiles uh, to awaken the Jews. So he says in, in, in verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Okay, so again, he begins this 
part of his letter or this chapter uh, by asking a rhetorical questions as he's been doing uh, in the previous chapters. And then he answers it himself. He says, certainly not. God has not cast away his people. So why is he saying, has uh, God cast away his people? Because uh, they feel that God has forgotten them because now the chosen uh, people, you know, the chosen generation is the church. To them, God has given the keys of the kingdom. Okay, so has he forgotten about the Jews because now the Gentiles have also been incorporated into the church, into God's plan, into God's blessing? So he says, certainly not. Uh, and he gives a proof, okay, of what he's saying. He's saying that, look at me, you know, I myself am a Jew, uh, I'm a seed of Abraham, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, but, you know, um, uh, I was somebody who was even persecuting uh, the Christians for believing in Christ or sharing the gospel message. But look at me, you know, uh, the gospel message came to me, Jesus encountered me, and here I am, uh, an, an, an example. Okay, so uh, he says that, you know, God has not cast them away, uh, even though the Jews have rejected the gospel and salvation is now taken to the Gentiles, um, and God's chosen people are now the church, but Paul says, certainly not, God has not rejected the Jews. He says, look at me, I'm an example, I'm a Jew, you know, myself, the tribe of Benjamin. I, I, I'm an example that God has not cast away his people. And he gives another proof from the Old Testament, uh, from uh, First Kings chapter 19. Here he's talking about uh, the prophet Elijah. Now, the prophet Elijah, you know, he has just finished this uh, uh, great event on the on the mountain where, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, he tells uh, the worshippers of Baal, you prepare your altar, you sacrifice to God, and you ask your God to send fire. So the prophets of Baal, they prepare the altar, they ask their God to send down fire, and they cut themselves, they scream, they shout. The whole day, uh, Elijah gives them... Um, time but there's no fire from there god and then you know we know what elijah does he builds the altar he builds a trench he pours uh, uh, you know barrels of water uh, on the offering so that people don't say there was a fire there and you know it just came out and he does not scream shout cut himself dance or do any of those gimmicks but he just calls on god and god sends the fire not only burns the animal but even burns the stone the mud the water everything Okay, and then people realize that uh, Elijah's God is a true and living God. And then, you know, Elijah gives, um, uh, uh, you know, tells the people to kill all the prophets of Baal. And they kill about 400 prophets of Baal. And when Jezebel comes to hear this, she's very angry. And, um, you know, she sends word to Elijah saying that, uh, you know, uh, be sure what you did for the prophets of Baal, I will make sure it's done to you. So what does Elijah do? He's so afraid, he's running for his life. You know, an angel of God meets him, gives him food, strengthens him, and finally he's hiding in the cave. And God is asking Elijah, hey, Elijah, what are you doing here in this cave? And he's like, you know, God, I'm the only prophet left, and you know, Jezebel is going to take my life. And what does God tell him? God, you're not the only person left, but there are 7,000 men who God has preserved who have not bowed down their knees to Baal. Elijah thought, you know, the wicked queen Jezebel has killed everybody. So uh, what is Paul basically trying to say here? He's basically trying to say that God has a remnant. He's not given up on his people. He's not forgotten about his people. See, there are a few Jews who have accepted him, who have made the choice uh, to believe in Christ, to receive the gospel message. They have received righteousness by faith. And so, you know, Paul is saying, I'm an example. He's giving an example of Elijah, of how God preserves 7,000 men who have not bowed their knees to Baal. And God is saying, uh, you know, Paul is saying, sorry, that, you know, there is a remnant that God has kept among the Jews who have accepted him uh, by faith. So God has not cast away his people uh, totally. Okay, so in the same way, today, even though there seems to be a widespread rejection of the gospel among the Jews, yet, you know, God has uh, a few people, a few Jewish people, a remnant of them who have said yes to this gospel. And so Paul is saying, I am one of them who said and yes.
Okay, and that is what he says in uh, verses two to verse six. So can somebody read that, please? Verses two to six. Verse two says, God has not cast away his people who he foreknew, or do you not know that the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your orders, and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Verse five and verse six, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Okay. So Paul here is writing in verse 5, he's saying, even so then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace grace so he's saying there are people who are elected by grace now this word again elect election chosen select uh, you know or chosen beforehand comes up the word election or selection must here also be interpreted or understood in the light of how we interpreted the rest of uh, romans when we look at chapter 9 um, uh, when we looked at God's selection or election, we said that it's not a partial selection of people. It's not eliminating or discriminating few and choosing a few others. Uh, but here it means all those who said yes to the salvation message, all those who said yes to Jesus Christ, all those who said yes to what Jesus has done on the cross, they are the ones who receive the call. They receive the call by grace. They are the ones who are selected. Okay. As I've already mentioned, uh, uh, you know, that those who believe and confess with their mouths will receive salvation. They will become the elect, the select, or the chosen ones in Christ. We already looked at this in, uh, in chapter 10. Okay, so it's not here again, God predestining a few to choose him uh, uh, or to, uh, you know, to be aligned to his plan and purposes, to be part of his kingdom. And uh, a few who he discriminates and he uh, predestines that they will go to hell. No, it's the choices that, you know, uh, it predestines uh, whether they are uh, in God's kingdom or not, whether they are going to be sons and daughters of God or not. It's our own choices uh, that, you know, brings about our own consequences. So Paul says that those who embrace Christ, they receive salvation by grace, and it's not by works. We've already looked at this in the previous chapters. They're chosen by grace and not by works. So Paul is saying that those who said yes to the salvation message, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they receive uh, righteousness by faith. It is uh, through grace uh, by faith, okay, um, that they receive their uh, salvation, okay? So it's not by their own works, but it's because of their faith in Jesus Christ, what he has done on the cross, that they have received this grace. So in verses 1 uh, to verse 6, Paul is saying that God has not given up on Israel, on a large scale, they have rejected the gospel, but yet God has not given up on them. There are a few who have made the right choice, who have said yes to the gospel, and uh, you know they have received it by grace. Okay, and Paul says, "I am one of them, and there are others as well. There is a few remnant who have received this righteousness by grace uh, through faith." Okay, and so they have come uh, to become uh, children of God, to become sons and daughters of God. Okay, any questions about verses one to six? Any questions? Okay, if not, we will move to verses seven to ten. Can somebody read verses seven to ten, please? 
So this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God. They're looking for so earnestly. A few have the ones God has chosen, but the hearts of the rest were hardened. As the scriptures say, God has put them into a deep sleep. To this day, he has shut their eyes so that they do not see and close their ears so that they do not hear. Like what David said, let there be multiple table. Let their bountiful table become a snare and a trap that makes them think all is well. Let their blessings cause them to stumble and let them get what they deserve. Let their eyes go blind so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Thank you, Kung. So Paul is saying that uh, Israel as a nation, they have not got what they are seeking. Why? Because they are seeking or trying to receive righteousness by keeping the law. And, you know, they cannot receive righteousness by keeping the law. It does not work that way. But the elect, the chosen people, those who said yes uh, to the gospel, they received this righteousness by faith. And it's by grace, through grace, that they receive this righteousness. It's not through works. So what about the rest of the Jews? He says the rest of Jews who, who do not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, he says the rest of them are blinded. Okay, They're blinded to the truth. They're blinded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're blinded to uh, what Jesus has done for them on the cross. And he quotes two passages from the Old Testament uh, in verse 8. In verse 8, Paul is basically quoting from Isaiah chapter 29, verses um 10 to 13, uh, 10 and 13, and Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 3 to uh, 4. So he's talking of the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the Jews, they have a spirit of stupor or a spirit of slumber, okay? And in verse 9 and 10, he's uh, quoting from what David said in Psalm chapter 69, verses 22 to 23. So he's saying, yes, there's a few people a few remnant, a few Jews who have, uh, you know, been chosen. Why have been? Why have they been chosen, selected, elected? It's because they have said yes to the gospel. They have received uh, their righteousness by faith uh, uh, in Jesus Christ. Their faith uh, in Jesus Christ and what He's done on the cross. And then He says, "What has happened to the rest of the Jews?" So He says, "The rest of the Jews, they are blinded." Okay, it's not that God has blinded them from understanding or receiving the gospel, but it's that, you know, there is it's their own spiritual pride or it's their own, uh, you know, uh, uh, choice that they are making uh, that they don't want to see the truth. They don't want to believe the truth. So where does this blindness come from? Or what is causing this blindness? There are two sources. One source is our own choosing or us departing from the truth. We choose not to see the light. So he's saying that, you know, the, the, the Israelites, some of the Jews, is they chose to depart from the truth. They chose not to see the light. And uh, there could be various reasons why uh, they could have done this or why people even today reject the gospel, why their eyes are blinded. It's because they chose to depart from the truth. And uh, he's, uh, you know, just like John wrote, he says, men love darkness rather than the light. So some people love darkness. They love to live in the darkness. They don't want their darkness to be exposed by the light. And so he says, you know, the first reason why uh, these people's eyes are blinded is because of their own choosing. They departed from their truth. It's their own predisposition. You know, um, when we, it's our own, sometimes it's our own predisposition. We choose to go away from the truth. And that's when God gives us up. Remember, he's, he's a God who's given us a free will to choose. Uh, he says, you want to make this choice? He helps us to make the right choice. But if we want to choose, you know, he lets us go our way. Uh, he says, okay, you want to make this choice? You want to go that way? Then you can go that way. He just gives us up. So this is one source of blindness. Uh, the other source of blindness uh, can be even Satan that blinds the minds of those uh, who believe. Uh, he basically puts a veil. He basically covers us. He causes a blindness on people. 
so when Paul is saying that God has given them a spirit or stupor in verse, uh, 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 in verse 8 of chapter 11, uh, you know, we can ask this question, would God uh, uh, himself, you know, put that blindness? No. You know, God cannot blind the eyes of people from seeing the truth. If we say that God is causing that blindness or God is causing them to be blind from seeing the truth, then it will be, be our self-contradicting ourselves. So because, you know, or God can even be self-contradictory. God could be contradicting his own self. Uh, you know, how could he on one hand say, I want you to accept and receive my son. I want you to accept and believe in the message of uh, Christ. And then would he again work against himself by preventing people from receiving the message? No, God cannot contradict himself. He cannot go against what he is doing. Uh, uh, no, could God do that? Could he work against himself? You know, definitely not. So here it says that, you know, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear uh, to this very day. So how do we understand this? Because here it says God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears they should not hear to this very day. So are we saying that God is causing them to uh, be blind? Is God causing them not to hear the truth? No, we can't say that. Okay, uh, then how do we interpret this? Okay, if you say that God is causing them the blindness, God, God is causing them not to hear, then we can even say that, you know, God caused Pharaoh to harden his heart. Okay, which is not the truth. We already saw about this in Romans chapter 9, right? We saw in Romans chapter 9 that um, uh, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, but we said that we also read in scripture that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But we said, how do we interpret it? It's not that God caused his heart to be hardened so that he can display his glory. But we said, how did we interpret that? We said that, you know, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and God gave him up to his own choice. God gave him up to go in his own way. He says, okay, you want to harden your heart? This is what you want to do. You know, God allowed him to harden his heart. It's not that God hardened his heart. It's not that God caused him to harden his heart. Okay, so how did we interpret it then? We said that, you know, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he made a choice to harden his heart. So God let him go his own way. So here also when we read that God had given them up to a spirit of stupor, that their eyes should not see and their ears should not hear, it does not mean that God darkened their eyes or God blinded their eyes or God did not, you know, block their ears from hearing the truth. That is not how we interpret it. We interpret it in the rest of the other scripture, how we interpret it, what uh, we, we uh, read about Pharaoh. Also, for example, if you take Judas, you know, uh, did God make Judas betray him? Because he wanted somebody to betray him so that he can, you know, it can lead him to be, uh, uh, to be uh, arrested so that he can be crucified. Did God cause Judas to uh, make that choice? No, you know, if God caused Judas to uh, betray him, then, you know, Judas had all the right to say, God, you know, you caused me to do it. And my betrayal actually helped you to fulfill God's plan and purpose. And because of me, you actually went to the cross. So I am actually also a greater savior. You are a savior. I'm also a greater savior because because of me, it made it possible for you to go on the cross. No, we don't interpret it that ways. Okay, we see that Judas made his own choice and God allowed Judas to go his own way, make his own choice. And we see the end result. We know that Judas, it was Judas' own choice. How do we know it? Because Judas was so burdened, so guilty of what he did. And we know that he went and um, hung himself up. If it was God's will, you know, he wouldn't have that restlessness. He would not like that peace. He would not go and hang himself. So we don't, uh, you know, we don't interpret what Judas did saying that God caused him to do it. Or we don't say Pharaoh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So likewise here, you know, like we interpret the rest of scripture here also, we see that, you know, um, God did not blind the eyes of the Israelites. 
stopping them from seeing the truth so that the salvation, the gospel can be taken to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles can receive salvation. Or God did not cause their ears, uh, you know, to be blocked so that they don't hear the truth. It's their own choices. So just like we interpreted, you know, what we read in Romans chapter 9 about Pharaoh, the same way we understand Romans chapter uh, 11 was 8, we interpret it in the same sense. And also, uh, to give another example, if you would want, you know, we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, we say that we see that God gave them up to their uncleanliness. God gave them up enough proof that there is a God. He says, even creation, you know, creation reveals the invisible attributes of God. Creation reveals the glory of God. It reveals the eternal power of God, the deity of God, the Godhead. Okay, you have enough proof. But he says, in spite of me giving these proofs, if you still want to go and worship idols, he says, God says, I give them, I gave them up to their uncleanliness. In verse 26, he says, God says, of Romans chapter 1, God gave them up to their vile passions. As a result of them worshiping idols, you know, it led to uncleanliness, wild passions. And also in verse 28 of chapter 1, God says, I gave them over to a debased mind, to a fallen mind. Why? It's not because God wanted them uh, to have a debased mind. No, not that he wanted them to indulge in wild passions, not that he wanted them to uh, live in uncleanliness. Why did he give them up? Because it was their own choice. It was their own will. It was their own decision. So it was what they wanted to choose. He gave them up to their own choice. Didn't God foreknew that Judas would betray Jesus? Yes. He also says that one among you will betray me, right? He had, uh, uh, through the, the, the gift of the Spirit, he already knew who's going to betray him. Did God know that uh, Judas is going to betray him? Yes, God knew. Did God knew that Adam and Eve are going to eat from the tree that God is telling them not to eat? Yes. Uh, did God know that Pharaoh is going to harden his heart? Yes. Did God know that uh, that uh, Charles is going to uh, choose him as his personal savior? Yes. Did God know that others are not going to choose him? Yes. Okay. But, uh, you know, irrespective of uh, the choices that we made, that's what we've been talking about this in chapter 9 and chapter 10, God still goes about doing his plan, his, his sovereign will, irrespective of man's choices. Yes, man can choose to do God's will, but even if man goes against God's will, God can still go ahead and fulfill his plan and purpose. And that is what we've been seeing in history. Yes, Pharaoh hardened his heart, uh, but did God uh, set his people free just like he promised Abraham that there would be uh, slaves uh, in, an, in an unknown country for 400 years and then God said he will send, uh, you know, deliver them and take them to the promised land? Yes, God promised, he kept his promise, even though for Pharaoh's heart was hardened, uh, he kept his promise. So God, in spite of the choices that you and I make, God can still bring about his plans and purpose. He can still fulfill his divine plans and purpose. So did God know Judas was going to do it? Yes. Uh, did he allow him to do it? Yes. Because, you know, God, um, you know, respects the choices that he, uh, that we make. He created us in his image. He gave us a free will to choose. He respects our choices. Does he help us to make the right choices? Yes, he does. But when we don't, he gives us up just like uh, we saw. He gave up Pharaoh. He gave up Judas to make his own choice. We read also in Romans chapter 1, verses 24, 26, and uh, 28. So when we say uh, that uh, we read here in verse, uh, verse 8 of chapter 11, God has given them a spirit of stupor. So did God give them a spirit of stupor? No. You know? God, they chose darkness, they chose to reject Christ, and God gave them to, to let them go on their own way. He chose them to go on their own way. So what Paul is saying here is, you know, Israel was not able to obtain, or the Jews are not able to obtain their own righteousness the way they want, but there are some who obtained it by grace, and the rest are in blindness and in darkness, and they are there because God has let them to make their own choices, to live by their own consequences of their own choices and their own decisions. Okay, is that clear? Is it clear? Yes. 
Anyone has any questions, any doubts? Uh, did I help answer your question, Charles? Okay, if there are no questions, yes, it on. did. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Okay, we'll move on. Can somebody else please read uh, verse 11 to verse 15, please? Somebody who's not read. Can I ask Subhajit to read verse 11 to 15? Or anyone else can read 11 to 15, please? I said, I said, uh, uh, have fall, but through their fall to provoke, the, provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their faithfulness? For I speak to your Gentiles, in as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them, for if their being cast away is the recon reconciling of the world, what will their accept acceptance be but, but the life from the dead? Thank you, Abinas. So here Paul is writing, saying that I say then, I say then, have they stumbled? Abhinash, you have to. Okay, thank you. Okay. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. So he's asking another uh, question. Okay, uh, and this question is similar to what he asked in uh, verse 1. Has God cast away his people? And he says, no, God has not cast them away uh, because there are some people among uh, the Jews who have believed, who have accepted the gospel, they received their righteousness by faith. So here the next question, he says, so have they fallen uh, because of their state of blindness or are they in a place where they cannot be brought back uh, so have they fallen or, they, or are they in a, in a place where they cannot be brought back? Uh, he says, certainly not. Okay, so the word fall here or fallen, you know, it says, uh, you know, just basically means have they trespassed or have they gone out of their way or have they gone out of the way? So he says through their fall. So he says it's very clear that it is their fall and their Trespass. It's not that God has put them in blindness and that uh, that blindness has uh, put them into this trespass, but he's saying through their fault. That means he's, you know, he's saying it's your choice. Okay. It's your choice that you make that you have made uh, to reject Christ, to reject the gospel of salvation, to receive a righteousness by faith. It's your choice. So he says very clearly it's through their fall, it's through their fall and their trespass. Okay, it's not that God has put them in blindness and their blindness that uh, has uh, has put them into trespass, but it's because of their own choice, their own mistakes. But he says, but through the trespass of the Jews, you know, God is going to do something. Okay, even though they have rejected him, uh, he's still going ahead with his plan. Okay, he's still going ahead with his, uh, his sovereign will that all men uh, come to know the truth uh, or the salvation that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's going ahead with his plan and he's, uh, you know, he's brought about salvation or the gospel message to the Gentiles and many of the Gentiles are receiving salvation. And he's saying by doing this, also, in some ways, you know, uh, uh, you know, he's provoking the Jews to jealousy so that by this means, at least some of them uh, can come to receive a righteousness in Christ Jesus by faith. So he's saying that the Jews are in darkness and sin, but God is going to use the salvation uh, that he's brought about to the Gentiles to awaken them, to bring them back and to provoke them. 
So in verse 12, he's saying the following, falling away of the Jews has brought so much of benefit for the Gentiles. You know, the failure of the Jews has brought riches and blessing to the Gentiles. And he says, think what will happen, you know, if the Jews just fall in line. Think what will happen if the entire Jewish race or many of the Jews, if they accept uh, Jesus Christ. Just imagine the immense blessing uh, that will uh, that will re be blessed uh, that the Gentiles will receive, or how immensely blessed uh, you know uh, the Gentiles will be, just because of their rejection of the gospel, uh, just because of their failure, it has brought riches and it's brought so much of blessing to the Gentiles. Just imagine if the Jews accept salvation, they accept Jesus, how much more will the Gentiles be blessed? What supernatural blessings will just an outflow of blessings uh, that will just uh, flow out on the Gentiles as a result of uh, the Jews just accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He says, even though he's an apostle to the Gentiles, what he really likes to do by preaching uh, the gospel message or bringing the salvation message or reaching out to Gentiles is that even as the Gentiles receive salvation through the gospel that Paul is preaching out, he's saying he's hoping that in some ways, you know, it will provoke the Jews to jealousy so that they too can be saved. So he says, yes, I'm an apostle to Gentile, I'm preaching to them the salvation, but he's saying by some means, even as I'm doing this, you know, I'm just believing that it will provoke uh, the Jews to jealousy so that they too can be saved. And verse 15, he says, but if their being cast away is reconciling the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So he's saying if the Jews come to faith, there will be a great grand resurrection that is going to take place. In fact, that is what is going to take place uh, as a great revival, uh, which is spoken of in uh, Revelation, that you know there will be a great uh, ingathering of souls from among all the people of uh, uh, Israel uh, just before the final resurrection from the Dead. So he's saying that if, you know, uh, just before the final resurrection, there will be a great ingathering of uh, or harvesting of souls, a revival among the Jews uh, just before the final uh, resurrection. So just summing up what Paul has been saying, uh, uh, telling us so far in Romans chapter 11, he says, God has not given up on the Jews, but they have chosen darkness. And because they chose darkness, they refused to see the uh, the truth in the gospel that is in Jesus Christ, salvation was given to the Gentiles. And this salvation was given to the Gentiles also as a way to provoke uh, the Jews to jealousy. So if their darkness or their rejection of the gospel has brought salvation and blessing and riches to the Gentiles, how much more um, will the Gentiles receive blessing if the Jews receive the gospel or they become righteous by faith uh, through grace okay so this is what uh, just a basic summary of what he's been uh, saying in verses 1 to verse 15. we'll move on to verses uh, 16 to um uh, 20 uh, 16 to verse 25 or 26 so can somebody quickly read verse 16 to verse 25 please It says, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them become, became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, Branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of the unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Verse 22. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell. On those who fell. Severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. 
And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. But if you were cut off the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mis mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. Very interesting how Paul presents this truth to us. He's just basically painting a very beautiful picture of an olive tree. Uh, so you can just imagine uh, two olive trees. One is a cultivated olive tree in a cultivated land where it's been uh, you know, taken care of you know, uh, cared for. And there's another wild olive tree just, just growing uh, in the wild, okay? The cultivated olive tree here represents Israel or the Jewish nation or the Jewish race. Um, and he's saying that some of them who did not believe, when they do not believe, what does God do? He cuts off the branches. He takes off the branches. He cuts off the branches uh, of uh, uh, of the olive tree, the cultivated olive tree, of those people and his branches that are cut off are those Jews who do not accept the gospel. And what does he say? He says that, you know, God, uh, you know, uh, grafts in branches of the wild olive tree. And who is the wild olive tree? The wild olive tree are the Gentiles. The Gentiles who believe, who receive righteousness by faith, when they receive righteousness by faith, they are kind of grafted into the main cultivated olive tree. So they receive the blessings that uh, God gave to Abraham, they receive the riches, they become part of the kingdom of God, they become children of uh, God, and they become part of what God is doing. But he's telling the Gentiles, hey, now since that you have accepted righteousness by faith, you have believed in Jesus, you've been grafted into the cultivated olive tree, uh, that is uh, the Jews, don't uh, boast, don't be proud, okay? Um, don't boast because you've been grafted in there, but remember, the tree is standing there because of its roots. And uh, who are the roots? The roots are the the Jews, the origin of the Jews, it is Abraham, who is, and uh, Abraham, and the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all those who believed, who God gave the covenants, who God gave the promises, the origin of the Jews, they are the roots, okay? So don't boast that you are superior to the Jews. Maybe you have, you know, your Gentiles, you've accepted uh, God's, uh, you've received righteousness by faith, uh, you've come into the church, you've been grafted into the tree of life, you're part of the kingdom of God, you are children of God, you are the seeds of the promise, you've received the promises, you've received the blessings that God spoke uh, to Abraham, to his seeds, but he says, hey, don't boast, don't think that you're superior to the uh, Jews, you're grafted in by faith, so do not be proud. In verse 22, he says, uh, you know, uh, because there is, we can see there is both the goodness of God and the severity of God. God is a God of truth and a God of justice. He's a God who is good to all those who respond to his message, all those who accept Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, all those who respond to him in faith, who accept him by faith, who believe in him by faith, he's good to them. But those who do not believe in him, he has to deal with them very severely. So even among the Jews, you know, God, he says, God is able to bring them to the faith if they respond in faith. But if they continue in unbelief, you know, he gives them up to their own choices. And in verse 24, he says, think about how God is grafting the branches of the wild olive tree into the main olive tree. Okay, verse 25 says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, which means, you know, God is revealing a secret. Uh, the plan of God on the earth, uh, he's revealing his plan, his mystery of what he's going to do here on the earth. You know, what is God going to do here on this earth? What is this mystery that he's revealing? God is bringing in the branches of the wild olive tree into the main Olive tree. That means he's bringing in the Gentiles into the kingdom of God to being heirs of uh, 
uh, of with uh, you know hairs of God, coal hairs with Christ Jesus, is bringing them into His original plan. Um, uh, but He's doing this, you know, He's bringing the Gentiles into the plan and purposes of God. But He's doing this. Notice verse what He says in verse twenty five. He says, "Blindness in part has happened to Israel." until the fullness of the gentiles has come in so god has allowed israel to be in a state of blindness that means he's not saying okay you be blind no he's giving them up to their own choices okay, he's allowing them to be uh, in their own choices the face their own consequences of choices until the gentiles are brought in and grafted in and then he's going to not give up on his own people He's going to awaken the Jews. He's going to work among them. He's going to bring them also back into the tree. Uh, and he's going to graft them in. And so this is what God is doing on the earth now. God is allowing all the peoples of the earth to come in, to become part of his kingdom, part of his plan, his purpose. And he's gathering him, uh, all of them in. And then he's going to go after Israel. He's not forgotten them. He still has a plan for them. He's going to pursue them. He's also going to graft them back into the tree of life. Yes, Mangi, you have a question? Thank you, Pastor. Um, my question uh, is about the Jew Jewish. So uh, we, we now understand that everyone has free choice and they can either choose to believe or not believe or to harden their heart or soften, soften it. So now the each of the Jewish at the end, how, why is God going to pursue them? Uh, and he has given them uh, the free choice to choose, to either choose him or to choose the world. So, and if he's going to pursue them, where, where is their free choice? Then it's like he's forcing things to them. Uh, yes, thank you. thank you, Mikey. Yes, he's pursuing, going to pursue the Jews. Uh, which means uh, he's not going to, those who are going to reject them, he's going to twist their arm and, you know, say, hey, accept me. You know, uh, you have to come into my plan and purpose. You have to be grafted uh, because you're my chosen people. No, again, there is the free will to choose. So he's, uh, what Paul basically is saying is he's not forgotten. God has not forgotten about the Jews. Even though salvation has gone to the Gentiles, God is reaching out the whole, whole world. Uh, you know, he doesn't mean that he's forgotten about the Jews and the Jews are not receiving the gospel now. The gospel is not being preached to them. No, the gospel is being preached to them. Uh, but God is saying, you know, he's going to work in their lives also. And those who's going to make a choice, those who are going to choose him, you know, they're going to be grafted back in the tree of life. The same way for the rest of mankind. Okay, he's going to pursue everybody. Not just pursuing the Jews, he's going to pursue everybody. Okay, uh, he's going to go behind everybody. Uh, we also know that there are some people that God pursues them till the deathbed. Some people have accepted Jesus on the deathbed. Okay, we can say that's unfair, but it's it's God who makes, he's a judge. Uh, but he pursues everyone. Why does he pursue everyone? He does not want anyone to, you know, land up in hell. He, he died. God so loved the world that he gave up his only son. You know, he gave him up for his own world, okay? Uh, but whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So again, the choice is there. So even though he's going to pursue uh, you or me or, you know, pursue people we are praying for, uh, who are Gentiles, he's same way he's going to pursue the Jews. Uh, but if they don't still choose to, uh, you know, make the choice to, you know, be grafted back into the tree of life to receive him as their personal savior, accept him as a personal savior, he's going to give them up to their own choice. God is not, at any moment in time, is not going to override our choices. He's going to let us live and choose and go by our own choices. Did that help, Maggie? Yes, Pastor. Yes. So uh, why are we saying this, that he's going to pursue the Jews is because the Jews feel forgotten, but uh, so Paul is writing to them and saying, hey, don't feel left out, don't feel forgotten. God has not forgotten you, he's still pursuing you. He's going to pursue you. Okay, just like he's going to pursue everybody on the earth. But since specifically we're looking at it in the context of Jews and Gentiles, and he's writing specifically these chapters, 9, 10, 11, he's talking about uh, 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 Israel as a chosen nation, he's mentioning this. 
So we always need to interpret scripture in the light, in the context of what who is being written to, uh, what uh, is the, the context in which is writing, and also interpret it in the rest of the other scripture. Did that help? Okay, anyone else has any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, we'll continue from uh, verses 26 to the end of uh, chapter 11, and it's verse 36 uh, on Wednesday, and then we'll move on. Okay. Uh, our next ass assessment is due, so maybe I'll just uh, post a date on the stream page. You all can just, uh, you know, share your comments if that's fine, and then we'll go ahead. With it. Is that okay, everybody? Okay, for our next assessment, that is, uh, we finished chapters 1 to 4. We will have from chapters 4 to 8. Uh, 1 to 4, sorry, 5, 6, 7, 8. We'll have 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, so I will just post the date and you all can just share your views uh, and then we will take it on from there. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Have a blessed weekend. Enjoy your weekend. Feel refreshed and strengthened. And I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Rupa.